number 10 spot, we have the iconic movie, The Matrix. I can admit, I thought this movie was just about how cool Keanu Reeves is. Um, yum, 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 yum. But it turns out there's a lot more. The movie is really about how humanity's idea of reality is dying. When Morpheus shows Neo the world as it really is, he welcomes him to the desert of the real. That line is actually taken from a book by the philosopher Jean Baudrillard called Simulacra and Simulation. This book is actually in Neo's apartment and it is open to a chapter on nihilism. This really drives home the movie's message about reality and what that means. Nihilism is the belief that all beliefs are meaningless, kind of like the inception of ideologies. The movie also touches on how many of the people living inside our systems don't realize that we're in a system because we've never had the opportunity to step out and see it from the outside perspective. It's definitely an interesting thought, and maybe if we're able to run with this idea a little bit, it could help us improve the world that we live in. Coming in at number 9, we have World War Z. One of the better movies to come out of the huge surge of zombie flicks that came when zombies were the biggest thing hitting the film industry. It had Brad Pitt fully formed into his dad role, and he was tasked with saving the world from a zombie pandemic. I mean, it's a zombie movie, I didn't have to tell you the plot for you to figure it out. But some people think that this movie, and many others like it, are the work of the Illuminati. Whoa! Boy, you kind of snuck up on me there. I am very, very sneaky, sir. There's a conspiracy theory that the massive surge of zombie movies was all because the Illuminati wanted to condition us to the idea of a massive viral outbreak, basically to numb our senses so when they release a global pandemic for real, no one freaks out, and they keep going on with business as usual. Some people think that the current pandemic that we're in could be the work of these evil plague political puppeteers, which might be believable if this was the first time that there ever had been a global global pandemic, but these things pop up about once every hundred years, so it's actually par for the course. Moving on to number eight, we have the 1960 Alfred Hitchcock classic horror film, Psycho. By now, we all know the movie goes, creepy Norman Bates runs a cheap motel and has a really cool and good and nice relationship with his mother, except for one major problem, she's actually been dead for years. Spoilers. Norman has basically taken on his mother's persona, and when a young woman stops at the motel and Norman is attracted to her, his mother's personality goes out and kills her. It's weird. Anyway, just a little spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie, but at the end when Norman is thankfully getting arrested, there's a little moment that I missed while watching that's super creepy. During the arrest, Norman's mother is really taking over his mind, and we hear a voiceover of his thoughts, but it's actually his mother's voice. But then, just for a brief second, while the camera is lingering over Norman's face, we see an overlay of his mother's skull over his face. This shot is creepy on its own, but it is Hitchcock's way of giving us a visual representation of the extremely dark reality that is inside Norman's mind. Coming in at number 7, we have Anchorman. One of the best comedies of its time. It's when Will Ferrell was at the peak of making dirty comedies, and this one had a ton of amazing jokes, and the writing staff launched this movie into the category of best of all time. But one of the best jokes in the whole movie was hidden to a lot of moviegoers and could definitely be seen as dark depending on how you view it. There's one scene in the movie where Veronica Corningstone is out to dinner with some female employees from the news channel, and this is where they come up with the plot to throw out Ron Burgundy and usher in a new era of news reporting. Well, it just so happens to be that they are at a Mexican restaurant, and just so happens the name of that restaurant is Escupimo en su Alimento. And if we get into the English translation, we get, we spit in your food. That is an amazing bit that just flew over the heads of anyone who doesn't speak Spanish. But it also makes you think back to every restaurant you have been in and what they might have done with your food. Six, we have the incredible Jordan Peele movie, Get Out. While the message of the movie gets across to the viewer pretty directly, I was surprised to find out a few hidden moments that were included to really drive home its theme. One of these moments is the famous teacup scene, where Missy is stirring her tea in a cup, making a repetitive sound to give off the same hypnotic effect as a swinging pocket watch in order to put Chris into a trance. What I didn't know is that the teacup is actually symbolic of a time when slave masters would use a teacup in order to summon the people that they had enslaved. That's pretty messed up. The silver spoon that she uses to stir the tea is symbolic of the family's status in life, born with a silver spoon in their mouths. 
Another hidden message in the movie is basically the entire character of Rod. In the movie, the comedian Lil Rel Howery plays Chris's best friend, Rod, and is the movie's voice of reason. Jordan Peele has explained that this character is mimicking how black people watching horror movies would often interact with the films, especially considering the upsetting trope that black people are usually the first to get killed in horror movies. Rod says the things that people are yelling at the screen, like get out of the house or don't go in there. Rod is also there to show that there is usually a higher percentage of black people watching horror movies than are being represented on screen. Coming in at number five, we have Robocop. This one was very shocking to me. Did you know that the movie the movie Robocop is actually about Jesus Christ? What? Yeah. Jesus! Jesus Christ! Yeah, this story of a robot man with a handgun taking out crime is based on the story of Jesus. And this isn't just speculation. This was stated by the director of the movie, Paul Verhoeven. And when you watch the movie knowing this, you can see the not so subtle hints towards Jesus. The movie starts with a man who's trying to do good, and then he is horribly betrayed and killed by people that he thought were his friends. This is his crucifixion. Then we see him resurrected, more powerful than ever before. Obviously, Jesus had less robot parts in his resurrection. After that, you have him go on a quest for justice, and he must confront the people who stabbed him in the back. And if you're still not sold, at the end of the movie, you have Robocop walking across a very shallow level of water to make it seem as if he was walking on water. I never knew Robocop was Christian. Coming in at number four, we have one of the most classic psychological horror movies ever, The Shining. On the surface, the movie is really just about a guy who goes to a hotel to interview for a caretaker job and absolute mania ensues. But what is the movie hiding? Well, it is mentioned early on in the movie that the hotel was built over an Indian burial ground. The hotel even seems to boast about this fact, and it really sets the scene for the imagery to come that shows the movie's underlying theme of the Europeans' genocide of indigenous people. The movie's director, Stanley Kubrick, placed a lot of subtle references in everything from wardrobe to set decoration and even to the film's score. Some even believe that the scene with the blood pouring out of the elevator is a symbol for bringing up what is below the hotel. The final piece of imagery in the movie is the fact that it ends off with Jack at a 4th of July party. Many believe that the 4th of July is a holiday that best represents settlers false claims to the land that once belonged solely to indigenous people. Coming in at number three, we have Godzilla, maybe the most famous monster movie of all time. Godzilla movies are great, and the massive lizard tearing down the world brought with it the entire kaiju movie genre. Well, here's something that you didn't know about this movie, or at least I didn't know about the movie, but they were inspired by the Nagasaki and Hiroshima nuclear attacks. Yeah, when you hear that, it actually makes perfect sense. The first Godzilla movie came out in the 50s. At this point, Japan was definitely still in the throes of dealing with a nuclear disaster. Radiation sickness was a real thing and something that the entire country was terrified of. And what causes Godzilla to be created? Well, it's a nuclear radiated lizard. In the movie, they even take samples from the monster's footprints and they find massive of levels of radiation coming off the creature. It could be why this movie was such a big hit. It brought together an entire country to get entertained by something that was a common fear. Moving on down to number two, we have the X-Men. They are fierce and we love them, but what is the hidden message behind these mutant warriors? If you've ever wondered why the X-Men are always facing political issues, it's because they are meant to mirror our real-life marginalized groups, more specifically members of the LGBTQIA community. The mutants' powers usually begin to manifest around puberty, the same time that humans begin to discover sexuality, and a lot of the mutants feel shame about who they are and their special abilities. Colonel Stryker is the franchise's example of the prejudice and phobias that people in our world have to deal with, and why things like pride are so important. The series shows scenes of mutants coming out to very angry and upset parents, which is a very real and unfortunate situation that many people in queer communities have to deal with every single day. You can totally see why Magneto is so angry and fights for the freedom of the mutants to just be who they are. We should all take a page out of Magneto's book and fight for everyone to be treated the same because love is love is love is love. All right, guys, coming to the number one spot, we have Fight Club. Fight Club is an extremely rich movie that is packed with subtle messages. 
every time I see this movie, there is something more to take out of it. Like, I don't know if you know this, but there's the famous scene in Fight Club where Edward Norton has to throw himself down the stairs. They shot this scene over 30 times and Fight Club's director, David Fincher, ended up using the first take, but that's not the dark hidden message. Partway through Fight Club, we have Tyler Durden, who's played by Brad Pitt. And something that this character does for poops and giggles is splice in scenes from pornos into family-friendly movies at the movie theater that he works at. Oh, that's nasty. And if you watch the movie Fight Club very closely, you can see that Tyler Durden's character pops up before he's actually introduced to the movie. Director David Fincher splices him into certain scenes for just a second, because we all know the ending of Fight Club, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen this movie. Tyler Durden is actually the split personality that manifests itself inside the main character's mind. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Led Zeppelin. Rock and roll and Satanism have long been connected in some people's eyes, so it's no wonder that Led legendary band Led Zeppelin has experienced some of these dark connections. Back in January of 1982, evangelical broadcaster Paul Crouch began accusing different rock artists of hiding messages in their songs through backmasking, and one example that he pointed out was the classic Zeppelin tune, Stairway to Heaven. He directly pointed to a segment of the song where he claimed that when played in reverse, he was hearing the words, oh, here's to my sweet Satan, the one whose little path would make me sad, whose power is Satan. He will give those with him 666. There was a little tool shed where he made us suffer, sad Satan. Since this accusation of satanic messages, this has definitely become one of the most famous instances of alleged backmasking, which has only added to the legacy of Zeppelin. In our number nine spot today, we have Bob Dylan. Not necessarily who I expected to put on this list, but there was an interesting interview back in 2004 that made many people speculate that the musician might have sold his soul. In the interview, he was explaining that he owes his years of fame and success to a deal he made. The interviewer asked, why are you still out here? To which Dylan replied, it goes back to that destiny thing. I made a bargain with it, you know, long time ago, and I'm holding up my end. The interviewer, of course, had to follow up on what that cryptic message was. So he asked, what was your bargain? Dylan replied, to get where I am now. The interviewer asked, should I ask who you made the bargain with? He replied, with the chief commander. The interviewer clarified, on this earth? To which he answered, in this earth and in a world we can't see. I can totally see why some people decided to draw their own conclusions from this. I mean, it sounds like he is basically speaking in riddles. While he doesn't outright say that he sold his soul, some believe that this is what he was trying to say in that interview. In our number eight spot today, we have Ozzy Osbourne. One of the most famous rock stars ever, Ozzy has long been connected to the occult. I mean, Ozzy, Prince of Darkness, didn't just come from nowhere. Aside from the rumors, however, Ozzy has been fairly open about his personal connection to the devil. In a 1984 issue of Hit Parader, Ozzy said, quote, I really wish I knew why I've done some of the things I've done over the years. Sometimes I think that I'm possessed by some outside spirit. A few years ago, I was convinced of that. I thought I truly was possessed by the devil. I remember sitting through The Exorcist a dozen times saying to myself, yeah, I can relate to that. He even has expressed confusion over whether or not he's a medium for some kind of outside source or if something much more sinister is at play. When speaking of actually selling his soul, well, Ozzy had some less than comforting things to say. He said, quote, I already have. Well, you sell your soul to the devil when you do something yourself that you shouldn't, and I already have. I've lived my life to the fullest. If there's an afterlife, I've got a good f spot in the furnace. You know? <laughs> I'll see you there, Ozzy. In our number seven spot today, we have Jay-Z. Rapper Jay-Z has long had some interesting stories and conspiracies surrounding him, including his alleged connection to the Illuminati. You know, this secret society that conspiracy theorist claims possesses this crazy, unknowable power. People often make this connection with a lot of people in the rap and hip-hop industry, but it happens to Jay-Z often due to him referencing the devil multiple times in his music videos. I mean, a especially in the song Lucifer. People also make connections to certain imagery shown in his music videos and even in his merch or the things he wears himself as well, to things like the occult and Satan himself. Whether it's a pentagram, the all-seeing eye, or the phrase, do what thou wilt, it seems as though Jay-Z has some people in a satanic panic. In our number six spot today, we have Robert Johnson. Well known for being one of the most incredible guitar players of all time, Robert was one of those people that some members
members of the public simply just couldn't see how he was so talented, so of course that led to some extremely haunting rumors swirling about him. Some people claimed that he was only able to gain his talent through supernatural means, which many claimed was by way of the devil. Story goes that Robert headed to the crossroads where the devil took his guitar, tuned it, and showed him how to master the blues. Unfortunately, however, with this eerie tale comes a very tragic end. Some say that in exchange for his abilities, Robert had to offer the later half of his life. He exchanged much of his life in order to make this deal. Sadly, Robert would pass away at the exceptionally young age of 27. Many claim this was actually due to a poisoning made by a jealous man. Whatever the real story behind his life, talents, and tragic death, the legacy of Robert certainly lives on. He was an incredibly prolific musician who left behind quite the record collection. In our number 5 spot today, we have Niccolo Paganini. Niccolo was a professional violinist who was born in 1782. His parents began to send him to lessons when he was just 5 years old, and by age 15 he was already touring the world because he was so talented. What's interesting about Niccolo and his story, other than his obvious musical genius however, is the rumors surrounding his talent and subsequent recognition. According to some, people believe that his own mother summoned the devil in order for her son to be the extreme talent that he was. There are many modern diagnoses that could potentially explain some of what made Niccolo so talented, and I mean, we all know quite well that sometimes people are just born with extreme talent. But of course, in the early 1800s, people and their imagination certainly ran wild. The final reason why people believe Niccolo may have made a deal with the devil is because shortly before his death, Niccolo was quite sick. The doctors had a feeling he was nearing death, so they sent in a priest to pray over him. When Niccolo first saw the priest, it is said that he freaked out and sent the priest away. Many people believe that him pushing the priest away was only a confirmation of the fact that he was working with the devil. In our number 4 spot today, we have Giuseppe Tartini. Okay, so this story is one that is kind of similar to Niccolo's, but even more strange. Giuseppe was an Italian violinist and composer who lived during the 1700s. He went on to compose a song called The Devil's Trill Sonata, and not only this, but he also claimed to wake up one night to find Satan sitting on the edge of his bed playing the violin. It seems as though the devil really likes violins, apparently. What's extremely curious is after this alleged encounter, it is said that Giuseppe's violin skills hit heights never seen before. He was able to suddenly play extremely complicated trills that are impossible for most musicians, and apparently even today the sonata is too difficult for many musicians to play, which is why people believe that perhaps this story really was true. In our number 3 spot today we have Jack Parsons. Jack was a man who was born just a few weeks prior to the Wright brothers flying the first airplane, and being born at a time like this had him growing up dreaming of and reading sci-fi novels about rocket ships taking people to space. It is said that this love of rocket ships and these dreams of going to space are what led to him summoning the devil in order to make a deal. Jack wanted to sell his soul in exchange for a rocket ship. This deal didn't end up working, but Jack continued to study science as he grew older. Later in life, he stumbled upon the teachings of Aleister Crowley and tried his hand at summoning things again. This time he tried to summon a goddess by the name of Babylon that was said to possibly help men get to the moon one day. Technically, in some ways, it worked, because Jack Parsons ended up helping create the jet fuel that is said to still be used today. Maybe it was his original deal with the devil, maybe it was the goddess, or maybe it was just good old passion and drive that did it. Guess that all depends on what you believe. In our number 2 spot today we have Christoph Heisman. Back in 1677, Christoph was an artist who was working on a castle in Austria. He was so talented at his job that he had been commissioned by the nobles to do this work. There were rumblings about how he may have sold his soul to the devil, but no one was sure of it until it was said that Christoph confessed. He said he had 9 years prior and that he regretted it very much now and actually wanted an exorcism. They demanded to know if he was a practicing witch, but in the end it was decided that he he was not, and that instead the devil just had a very strong hold on him. The local priest began giving Kristoff exorcisms, and during these sessions, Kristoff explained that he had these intense visions where he was coming face to face with the devil, who was in the form of a dragon. The dragon was holding the contract that held Kristoff's soul, and this is when he was able to rip it out of the dragon's talons. When he woke up, it seemed as though he was cured. After this, he began painting pictures of the devil, and he even painted.
painted a story with multiple panels that told the story of how he sold his soul and how they helped him to get it back. In our number one spot today, we have Antoine Rose. This woman from the 15th century is often credited with our modern day image of a witch riding a broomstick. She became known as the Witch of Savoy, and she is said to have confessed to regularly meeting with the devil. I mean, let's be honest, history doesn't exactly have a good record with those accused of witchcraft, so it isn't quite clear if this deal with the devil was real, or if perhaps Antoine could just like add one plus one, and then suddenly she was accused of being a witch and had to find a way to try and defend herself. Legend goes that she was in a position where she was in dire need of money, and when she asked her neighbors for help, they led her to a group of people who convinced her to ask the devil for help. When the devil appeared, he agreed to help, of course, in exchange for her rejection of God and her promise to worship him. Story has it that she said the devil had a low, raspy voice when he appeared to her in human form, and she also apparently said that she was quite afraid of him. Can we really blame her? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Elvis Presley. There have been rumors and conspiracy theories surrounding Elvis Presley's success and his alleged deal with the devil to achieve fame and fortune. Some fans and theorists believe that Presley's success was not solely due to his musical talent, but rather his involvement in the occult and the supernatural. One of the most prevalent rumors surrounding Presley's alleged deal with the devil is the fact that he was born a twin, but his brother Jesse Guerin was stillborn. According to the rumor, Presley made a pact with the devil to trade his twin brother's life for his own success. I personally think that that is a particularly cruel rumor and conspiracy, and a much more on the side of those who believe that Presley's interest in mysticism and the occult was evidence of his involvement in dark practices. Some point to his love for black magic and spiritualism as proof that he made a deal with the devil. Despite the persistent rumors, there is no concrete evidence that Elvis Presley ever sold his soul or made a deal with the devil. These rumors are likely just a product of his enduring fame and the allure of the supernatural. In our number 9 spot today, we have Justin Bieber. I'll be honest, I am a believer. So it was news to me when I found out that some people think he too has sold his soul. Some have pointed to his music videos and lyrics, as well as his public behavior and controversial actions as evidence of his supposed pact with the devil. People believe that Bieber's meteoric rise to fame and success at a young age was too sudden to be natural, and that he must have made a deal with the devil to achieve it, while others point to his lyrics, music videos, and imagery, which they believe contain hidden symbols and messages associated with the occult. Many of these claims are most likely the result of speculation, rumors, and conspiracy theories fueled by Bieber's controversial personal life and the internet's tendency to spread sensationalized stories. But hey, who am I to say for sure? In our number 8 spot today, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania, and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she is also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah, weird and gross and also terrible. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. Not only this, but she is also said to have made a deal with the devil in order to gain this sort of power. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200, but some people claim that it might be as many as 600. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number 7 spot today, we have Madonna. Madonna has been accused of making a deal with the devil for her success and longevity in the music industry. The rumors have persisted over the years due to her use of provocative and controversial imagery in her performances, as well as her supposed connections to secret societies and the occult. Some people believe that her massive success in the music industry and her often controversial behavior are all signs that she made a deal with the devil. Others point to her use of religious imagery in her music and performances, which they believe is a deliberate attempt to subvert traditional religious values. Some people just can't get over that the girl wants to have fun, and she's been having fun, in the public eye, for decades now. I get it, Madonna gets a little carried away from time to time, but that doesn't mean the woman sold her soul, or does it? In our number 6 spot today, we have Johann Faust. 
According to the stories passed down about this man, it is said that he was an alchemist and astrologer who lived in Germany during the early 1500s. It is said that in his plight to become the smartest man in the world, while also enjoying as many earthly pleasures as possible, he summoned the help of a demon named Mephistopheles. There are terrible stories about how cruel and truly evil this man was, and as a professor, it is said that he looked down on everyone else. Local priests apparently believed that he had actually made a deal with the devil in which he sold his soul to him, and there are also stories that say his pet dog was actually a demon who was able to shapeshift. During his life, he did publish several grimoires, and in 1540, while conducting some sort of alchemaic experiment, his laboratory exploded. Just thought that was a fun little anecdote to share with you guys. In our number five spot today, we have Michael Jackson, definitely one of the celebrities who has had the most connections to the occult. Some fans and theorists believe that Jackson's success, talent, and enduring popularity could not be attributed solely to to his hard work and dedication, but rather to a supernatural pact that he had made. One of the most persistent rumors surrounding Jackson's supposed deal with the devil was that he made the pact at the age of 12. According to this rumor, Jackson traded his soul to achieve success in the music industry. Others have pointed to Jackson's fascination with the occult and his interest in spiritual practices as evidence of his involvement in the dark arts. Some also cite his dramatic physical transformations as proof of his alleged deal with the devil. At the end of the day, did Michael Jackson have a deal with the devil? Well, I guess I'll just let you decide for yourself. It's my way of saying no, none of these people did, because the devil doesn't exist. In our number four spot today, we have Aleister Crowley. This man is quite well known for being the leader of an occult group, and this really does stem back even into his childhood. It is said that quite early on, Aleister started calling himself the Beast and the Antichrist, and he is even quoted as saying that God and Satan fought over his soul. In one of his books, he wrote, Quote, I was in the death struggle with self. God and Satan fought for my soul those three long hours. God conquered. Now, I have only one doubt left. Which of the twain was God? Many people believe that perhaps he made a deal with Satan, but it is possible that these are just rumblings based on Alistair's teachings and beliefs. In our number three spot today, we have Beyonce, Queen B, an absolute living legend. Like her husband though, who we spoke about on part one, Beyonce has also been accused of being a member of the Illuminati and selling her soul for fame and fortune. The claim that Beyonce sold her soul is a conspiracy theory that has been circulating online for several years. However, there is no evidence to support this claim. Just don't want the f***ing B people to come for me. <laughs> The belief that Beyonce sold her soul likely stems from her success, which some people may find hard to believe without a supernatural explanation. I do understand that one. I mean, did you see Homecoming? Additionally, her music and performances often incorporate religious and spiritual imagery, which may further fuel the rumors. Also forgot to include that people think she's a part of the Illuminati. Okay, that's important. People think that she is directly related to a satanic organization. The success of talented and hardworking individuals like Beyonce is typically the result of dedication, perseverance, and talent, but some people just swear it's soul selling. In our number two spot today, we have Theophilus of Adna. For this one, we are taking it back a little bit, all the way to 538 AD. Theophilus of Adna was a cleric in the Roman Catholic Church. So basically, one day he was elected to become the new bishop, but he ended up denying the offer as it is said that he wanted a more priestly sort of position instead of one with all of that power and responsibility. It is said that he wanted the position of archdeacon, which would have seen him controlling where the donation money went. So apparently in passing on this bishop position, he thought that if he gave this bishop position to his rival, then his rival should at least be grateful enough to give him the position he wanted. But of course, this did not happen. The new bishop gave away the seat that Theopolis wanted and instead gave him the position of being a humble cleric. This made Theo super angry and this is when he thought that maybe the church isn't as holy as he once thought they were. This is when he decided to summon the help of Satan. He ended up signing a contract with Satan in his own blood. He denounced Jesus and the Virgin Mary and it is said that with the help of Satan he was once again voted into the bishop position and this time he accepted. At this point in time it is said that he felt so guilty he confessed to this deal with the devil and the priest who he confessed to decided that they should burn the blood signed contract. For a second Theo looked up but then suddenly he collapsed and died. Many people believe that it was because he had broken his contract. 
And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Jonathan Moulton. Jonathan is a man who was born in 1726 and he was known for his military career. He served in King George's War as well as in the French and Indian Wars, but after his service is where the story really starts. Basically, after his time fighting was over, he went on to become one of New England's wealthiest men. This caused heads to swivel and rumors to swirl because this wasn't something that was normally seen. This all gave way for the rumor that Jonathan had struck his luck of fortune because he was actually working with the devil. People began to say that for financial gain, he in turn gave his eternal devotion and even his soul over to the devil. The devil would visit him every month in order to fill up his boot with gold. You know what happens with things like this though, people get greedy. It is said that despite this lavish lifestyle he was already living, he wanted more and this led to him making the mistake of trying to trick the devil. He cut a hole in the floor above his basement and placed a boot over it which also had a hole in the heel. Of course he did this so that when the devil came with the gold, he'd get a whole basement full rather than just a boot. But the devil certainly caught on. From there it is said that he burned down Jonathan's house along with all of the gold that lay inside. Number 10. Apocalypse Now Curse Apocalypse Now is a 1979 epic war film produced and directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Now the whole production on Apocalypse Now was hell. It really was like an apocalypse. The production was doomed from the beginning as it took multiple tries before Martin Sheen was hired as the lead and Capla was writing the script as he went, which isn't ideal. They shot in a jungle and it resulted in many crew members catching various illnesses. Martin also suffered in various ways. In an opening scene, his character punches a mirror and rubs the blood on his face in a drunken rage and this was real and largely prompted by Capla's psychological manipulation of the actor, telling him, you're evil, I want all the evil, the violence, the hatred in you to come. Out. Capla also kept Martin drunk and locked him in a hotel for two days. Other horrible things that happened were monsoons put people in danger, a prop person put actual dead bodies in a group of fake ones, and Martin suffered a heart attack in the jungle. Capla himself was fraught with stress of the project. By the shoot's end, he lost 100 pounds, had an epileptic seizure, and attempted to end his life multiple times. The project that was projected to be six weeks long turned into 16 months. The final film gained critical acclaim, but if I was Capla, I probably would have given up, as it sounds like such a horrible experience. In fact, it was so bad a documentary on the hellish filming process was released in 1991, titled Heart of Darkness, A Filmmaker's Apocalypse. Number 9. James Dean's Car When actor James Dean introduced himself to British actor Alec Guinness during an encounter in Hollywood, he asked him to take a look at his car. Alec thought the car appeared similar Minister and told James, if you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. This happened on September 23rd, 1955, seven days before James's death, which is just creepy. On September 30th, James and his mechanic set off for a car race when another car driven from the opposite direction crossed into James's lane without seeing him. They crashed and James was pronounced dead on arrival to a local hospital. The mechanic who was with him died in a road accident in 1981 in Germany after surviving several attempts of trying to end his life. After the accident, a famous car enthusiast, George Barris, bought the wreck, which slipped off its trailer and broke a mechanic's leg. George sold some parts to two guys who raced each other and one died instantly and the other was injured. George later sold two tires which blew up at the same time, causing the buyer's automobile to go off the road. Later, one thief tried to steal the steering wheel and his arm was ripped open. After that, another man was injured while trying to steal the blood-stained front seat. After lending the rest of the wrecked car to a highway safety exhibit, the garage storing the car went up in flames, destroying everything except the car itself. The second display at a high school ended when the car fell, breaking a student's hip. While being transported, the truck containing the vehicle lost control, causing the driver to fall out and be crushed by the Porsche after it fell off the back. In 1960, when being returned to George Barris in LA, the car mysteriously vanished and has not been seen since, and that sounds like one evil car. Number 8. The Crow Curse The Crow is a 1994 American gothic superhero film, and the lead actor, Brandon Lee, was shot and died while filming 
filming this film in a horrific accident. But this wasn't the only dangerous accident surrounding the film. In an interview with the AV Club actor John Polito, who was in the film, described some of the events. We were shooting at night and the very first night they were setting up the lights, there was a guy who was driving a cherry picker onto the lot. A cherry picker that you put lights on. And when the cherry picker fell into a gully, we lifted the back of the cherry picker where the guy was lifted up and went right into an electrical pole and he was electrocuted. And he was near death, all of his organs were burned and he was about 26. His wife was pregnant and it was a bad luck opening to a film. And then the third night when we were shooting, I remember the prop truck caught on fire and nobody knew what that was about. And then we had a hurricane that destroyed parts of street sets. The hurricane was so bad. Of course, we were staying at the hotel Holiday Inn Cape Fear, so that should give you some sense of what the film was going to be like. And that sounds absolutely horrible. Number 7. The Oscar Curse Winning an Oscar is supposed to be a celebration, but some believe that winning an Oscar significantly drops the popularity of an actor. There are also other beliefs that an actress winning the award is doomed to have a rocky relationship with their partner that would culminate in a divorce or breakup. The theory is only fueled by the fact that over 12 Best Actresses winners, from Sandra Bullock, Therese Witherspoon, Halle Berry, Hilary Swank, and many more, divorced shortly after winning an Oscar. Now, while Lady Gaga didn't pick up the trophy for Best Actress, her Oscar for Best Original Song was followed with the subsequent announcement of her split from her fiancé, which further fueled these rumors. Sounds to me that these men they were with couldn't handle being with a successful woman, but who knows. Number 6. The Exorcist Curse The Exorcist, which came out in 1973 that told the story of a young girl's possession, is believed to have a curse after nine people connected to the film died during production. That's not all the leading ladies, Linda Blair and Ellen Burstyn, sustained major back injuries during the shoot. And what still baffles many is the fact that when the entire film set burned to ashes, the bedroom that was used to film Regan's exorcism was the only part of the set left untouched by the fire. And that is suspicious. Many strange occurrences continue to happen even after the film's release, with one rumor also stating that a church's cross was struck by lightning close to a theater that was screening the movie. Number 5. Superman Franchise Curse Another unlucky character is none other than the Man of Steel himself, Superman. Some believe there is a curse associated with the franchise. The first actor to play the character on TV in 1951, George Reeves, saw his character tank after the initial success of The Adventures of Superman. Eight years later, it was ruled that he died by taking his own life, though some may say it may have been due to somebody else. Then Christopher Reeve became a star with the 1978 Superman, the movie, and remained successful until he was thrown from a horse and paralyzed in 1995, and he died in 2004 at the age of 52. Other actors associated with the franchise, including Margot Kidder, Marlon Brando, and Richard Pryor are said to have been affected by the curse as well. Number 4. Macbeth Curse Saying the name of Shakespeare's play Macbeth is said to bring about a curse to any production. Experienced thespians know that you don't call Shakespeare's Macbeth by its proper name, you call it the Scottish play. Actors believe that uttering the title around in a theater brings bad luck, according to the Royal Shakespeare Company. Legend has it that when Shakespeare included real incantations in the play, a coven of witches cursed it. The actor playing Lady Macbeth is said to have died during the first performance, and subsequent performances since then have also had a series of accidents befall on actors. Now, of course, a play like Macbeth is going to have a history of some troublesome incidents after being performed for 400 years, but if you're a believer in the curse and you accidentally say the name Macbeth, Beth, the Royal Shakespeare Company says you must exit the theater, spin around three times, spit, curse, and then knock on the theater door to be allowed back in. Now, I take this curse very seriously as it is real, and ask any drama kid in your life. Number 3. The Poltergeist Curse The Poltergeist is a 1982 horror film, and one thing is for sure, you don't mess with the dead. It is said that the curse was brought upon the movie franchise because of the producer of the movie Taunted with the Spirits. After about a month of production, Joe Beth Williams found her pictures askew on the wall, then lights flickered on and off on separate occasions, and random fires and accidents were not uncommon. Once the first movie was released, the curse began to take its toll. Dominic Dunn had her life ended by her ex-boyfriend as she was strangled to death. The sequel took away Will Sampson and Julian Beck, who died of stomach cancer and kidney failure. Heather O'Rourke, who played Carol Ann in all three Poltergeist movies, died during the third installment from acute bowel obstruction. Aside from 
aside from untimely deaths, one actor claimed that real skeletons were used as props, a claim that remains unproven, and another is said to have performed an exorcism on set. So, no shocker, it was cursed. Number two, the 27 Club. Beginning with the deaths of several 27 year old popular musicians between 1969 and 1971, this cultural phenomenon, which came to be known as the 27 Club, attributes special significance to popular musicians, artists, actors, and other celebrities who died at age 27, often as a result of addiction or violent means, or ending their own lives, or transportation related accidents. One thing's for sure, the number of musicians who died at the age of 27 is definitely far from the norm. Some of the most famous 27 clubbers include Brian Jones, founder and guitarist for the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, pioneering electric guitarist, singer, and songwriter, Kurt Cobain, lead singer and songwriter for Nirvana, and Amy Winehouse, a blues singer and songwriter. Currently, there are 40 recorded members of the 27 Club. And coming in at number one, The Wizard of Oz Curse. The filming of The Wizard of Oz was a complete nightmare. It said that after bar hopping, the actors who played the munchkins would make Judy's life miserable by putting their hands under her dress. Then in a scene where Dorothy and her group are skipping down the yellow brick road, some think the dark moving figure hanging from a tree in the background is an actor who ended their life on set. Then, Buddy Epson was originally cast in the role of the Tin Man, but he was essentially poisoned by the makeup, which was made of pure aluminum dust. Nine days after filming started, he was hospitalized, sitting under an oxygen tent. Then Margaret Hamilton, who played the Wicked Witch of the West, had to film a scene where the witch disappears in a flash of smoke. The effects crew used real fire for the scene, and she was instructed to exit the stage via trap door, but the trap door's drop got delayed, and the fire started before she had time to exit safely. She suffered severe burns on her face and hand, and her eyelashes and eyebrows on her right eye were completely burned off, and her skin completely burned off of her hand. Also, the executives behind the film kept Judy Garland on a strict diet and forced her to take pep pills to control her appetite. She was meant to stay slim, and producers pressured her to stay in shape for the duration of the film. Judy was also slapped by the director of the film, Victor Fleming. Allegedly, it was because of her inability to complete a scene without giggling. And finally, do you remember the beautiful yet chilling scene of the gang falling asleep while it snows amongst the poppies? Well, the snow was actually just chrysotil asbestos, otherwise known as a cancer-causing substance. If anyone in the cast inhaled it, it could increase the risk of several serious diseases, including lung cancer. Starting off this countdown, we have the divas. Sometimes when you're rich and famous and used to getting pampered, it all goes to your head. You start off as someone who would do anything to get a role in a big film. But once you're already up there, you stop trying and maybe develop a bit of a diva attitude. Now, there are several celebrities that are known for being divas, and as a result, no one really wants to work with them anymore. They ruin their reputation. First off, we have Katherine Heigl. Apparently, she's one of the most hated actors in Hollywood. So for starters, on set, she has complained about wardrobe issues, she has refused to get out of her trailer to film, and apparently, she questions the script every single day on set. Then in 2008, she said she didn't want her Emmy nomination for her role in Grey's Anatomy because she felt like the writing on the show was bad. Another one that shocked me is Ben Stiller. Oh, I love him, but apparently he's whiny, demanding, and terrible to work with. And then Julia Roberts in the 90s movie Hook was also a diva, and the director, Steven Spielberg, even named her Tinker Hell. She played Tinkerbell, so Tinker Hell. It's funny. Good job, Steven. Coming in at number nine is discrimination. Now, this one is no secret by any means. It's been given a lot of media attention in recent years, but that doesn't make it any less scary. Take this in. In the history of the Academy Awards, only one woman has ever won for directing, and that was Catherine Bigelow for The Hurt Locker back in 2008. Still, that happened over 12 years ago. Surely we've progressed forward as a society and industry that we aren't still that sexist. And sexism and Gender equality isn't the only form of discrimination the industry has. There's also huge discrimination against people of color. Only one African American in the history of the Academy Awards has won an award, and that was Jordan Peele for Get Out. That award alone has only ever nominated five women and five African Americans. It's shocking. And it's good to note that I hope people realize that including black nominees doesn't necessarily mean they've solved diversity. What about South Asian nominees, East Asian, Latin? I could go on. Back in 
2016, 96% of decision makers in Hollywood were white and 87% of them were male. Forget winning awards, even roles in movies lack so much diversity. The majority of roles and lines are given to white people and mostly just men. In 2016, only 31.4% of speaking characters were women. This is such a problem in the industry and I don't think people realize how serious it truly is. Moving on to number eight, we have Elijah Wood. Several years before the Me Too movement exposed big Hollywood names, Elijah Wood actually came out and addressed Hollywood's predatory problems, especially towards young stars. He exposed specifics of Harvey Weinstein and other big Hollywood stars. He also said that as a child, he was never allowed to go to Hollywood parties because people of power would take advantage of the young stars there. He said, and I quote, if you're innocent, you have very little knowledge of the world and you want to succeed. People with parasitic interests will see you as their prey. What upsets me about these situations is that the victims can't speak as loudly as the people in power. But no one listened to him. He tried to expose them and stop these disgusting things from happening. Instead, he got boycotted by major studios because of this. Like, hello? He tried to warn everyone and make a change and he got in trouble for it? It wasn't until years later that Weinstein and everyone else got exposed and cancelled. Filling at number 7 saw is Charlize Theron, who has the same birthday as me, so I just love her, and yes, I found that out when I googled celebrities with the same birthday as me when I was like 12. Now this South African beauty is known for her versatile acting with roles in movies like Monster, Hancock, Mad Max, Fury Road, and more. But her backstory in early life is a lot darker than people know. She grew up near Johannesburg with her mom Gerda and her dad Charles. Her childhood was rough because her dad was a huge alcoholic and would threaten Gerda and Charlize whenever he was under the influence. Charles wouldn't hurt her, but he would physically attack her mum. One night in June of 1991, he got angry and fired shots at both of them. During that altercation, Gerda ran and grabbed her own handgun that she had kept hidden in case of an incident like this and shot back at him. Her shots killed him while Charlize watched it all happen at the tender age of 16. Thankfully, it was looked at as self-defense and Gerda never faced any charges. This one was kept so under wraps and it was done so well. I've seen so many of her interviews and movies and never once have I heard about this. Making our way down the list number six, we have the publicity stunts. I mean, there's no shocker here. If you want to get the public's attention back on you, all you gotta do is something extravagant. Maybe dye your hair, get the paparazzi to take an embarrassing photo of you, or in this case, date and break up with another big star. Stars do this all the time. They will get together just to promote their new movie or show or song together and then break up at a time that's convenient for them. This attracts a lot of attention and the movies or shows or whatever fare way better. For example, people think Kim Kardashian's marriage with Chris Humphreys was just all a sham. Or Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn. I didn't even know they dated. That for sure was a publicity stunt. No offense, but how does Jen go from Brad Pitt to Vince Vaughn? Doesn't make sense. Another example would be how Anna Faris and Chris Pratt broke up just a month before her book launched. Impeccable timing. Now, what's scary is how half the time these celebs have no say in this. They're forced into doing whatever their managers think is best for them, even if that means dating someone they have no interest in. They literally get stripped from their own free will. Coming in at number five are child stars. Honestly, this is sad because there's only a handful of child actors that didn't burn out or just have their career die the second they stopped being cute. Having that much attention on you, that much responsibility and fame at such a young age really messes up your psyche. Child actor Martha Plimpton made her film debut at 11 years old and said when children's lives become all about external validation, that can set them up horribly. Because what's adorable when you're 12 isn't when you're 25, which is very accurate. She went on to say when you stop getting calls about roles and auditions, you start thinking how you can replicate that high and so you do everything you can to stay in the spotlight. That may explain child star Amanda Bynes' behavior over the past few years, Lindsay Lohan's, Justin Bieber. Even Miley Cyrus when she went through that whole phase. If anything, the only unproblematic child stars I can think of are the Sprouse twins or the Olsen twins. I mean, yes, they're a bit coked up and all, but other than that, they seem fine. What is it with twins and being fine? It makes sense that these stars try to get attention any way they can. Child stars are exploited as soon as you put them in the spotlight, whether they're being treated well or not. A brain that young just isn't able to cope with that much attention, and it shouldn't be. So I feel like child stars should definitely just not be a thing. 
Stop it, you greedy parents. In our fourth spot, we have the murderers. Some of your favorite Hollywood stars might just be cold blooded killers, which is spooky when you think about it. Here are some famous actors that have sadly taken the lives of others. First off, we have Matthew Broderick. On August 5th, 1987, Broderick crossed into the wrong lane and collided head on with another car. The two women inside the other car were killed instantly. In 2015, Caitlyn Jenner rear ended a car, which got sent into oncoming traffic. The driver was struck by another car and died. Then we have Phil Lewis, or as we all know him, Mr. Mosby from Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Well, before his role, he struck a car while drunk driving and killed the other driver. He was convicted of manslaughter and driving under the influence and sentenced to five years in prison. Who would have known? But I'm sure all these actors feel super guilty for taking someone's life. Filling out number three slot are writers. It's always actors and directors getting the credit for everything, and yes, admittedly, they play a massive role in all of it, but there would be nothing to direct or bring to life without the writers. Writers in the industry have been undervalued and underpaid for decades. It's so bad that since 1960, the Writers Guild of America has walked off the job six times just to get studios to renegotiate writers' pay, but they claim a film hasn't made any money when it has. That's what Paramount did with the 1988 film Coming to America, which made $288 million at the box office. Studios do this so they don't have to pay their writers net profit, so the writer of that film, Art Butchwald, sued Paramount and won. He got $900,000 in settlements. Mel Gibson, who directed The Passion of the Christ, withheld $75,000 from screenwriter Benedict Fitzgerald, and thus he was credited as co-writer. I could go on, but the point is that there are way too many people in the industry that don't get treated right. That's what I'm gonna say. Coming in at number two, we have Natalie Wood. On November 29th, 1981, 43 year old actress Natalie Wood was found dead floating face down in the Pacific Ocean. She was wearing just her nightgown and socks. So, a couple days prior, Natalie, her husband Robert Wagner, Christopher Walken, and yacht captain Dennis Davern headed out on a yacht. Little did she know that she would not return home. The thing is, no one knows what really happened to her. Some say she slipped off the deck and fell into the water, while others are convinced that that Wagner or Walken have something to do with it. Or they at least know what happened. One theory is that Natalie and Christopher were having an affair. Wagner found out about it, got mad, and pushed her off the yacht. Wagner seems to be the prime suspect, but many people think that Walken knows exactly what happened. I mean, he barely even talked about the case, and on the rare occasion that he did, he would call it an accident. And he was absent from the documentary about her. I mean, he was on the boat. He should have been interviewed for the documentary. Entry. I don't know, I'm getting the vibe that he knows what happened and feels guilty about it. And finally, at number one is Scotty Bowers. Now, this infamous gay US Marine worked as a Hollywood pimp from the 40s to the 80s. And apparently, this man would set up all the Hollywood stars with whoever they wanted. Being heterosexual was all you could be back then in the public eye, but Scotty would let the actors choose whichever sex they wanted to be with, and apparently had a menage a trois with Lana Turner and Ava Gardner. Scotty was working as a gas station attendant at a gas station close to all the Hollywood studio lots back in the day. He got his start sleeping with actor Walter Pigeon, who then spread word about him and the money started rolling in. Scotty then expanded it to a trailer with beds and glory holes and so on, and he apparently set up Katherine Hepburn with 150 gorgeous brunette women. Studios and agents pressured all their talent to be straight, that what other outlet did they have? Rock Hudson was literally forced to marry his lesbian secretary, Phyllis Gates. Apparently, Bowers slept with so many stars, but had never seen any of their movies. He even had his own wife, Beth and a daughter, but was so busy in the brothel he would only sleep at home a few times a year. Eventually, the petrol pump slash brothel became way too well known, which meant a police raid could have occurred and people could have been arrested. A documentary about him came out in 2017, and Dylan McDermott even portrayed him in the 2020 miniseries Hollywood. Now that's something I gotta see. At number 10, we have The Curse of Poltergeist. Poltergeist was one of my favorite movies as a kid, which is nuts because most horror movies would scare the hell out of me, but for whatever reason, when I was a little tyke, I just loved this one so much and I thought it was so cool. But it seems like the dark energy that everyone was afraid of in the movie managed to work its way into the real world. More than one person who worked on the movie died not long after the movie was released. Actors Julian Beck and Will Sampson were both in Poltergeist 2 and died of natural causes, which might not really freak you out, but the one that freaks everyone out and is hard evidence of the curse is the one involving Dominique Dunn. Dominique Dunn played one of the daughters in the original movie. She was attacked by her ex-boyfriend. He walked 
walked up to her home while she was hanging out on the porch and then he strangled her to death. It was a shocking murder that made headlines everywhere. Probably one of the most saddening parts about this murder was that a lot of people thought she was going to have a promising career and she already had a new role booked. At number 9 we have Rescue the Boobies. Some of you may be old enough to remember the classic animated movie The Rescuers. Well apparently the original release of the movie had a little bit of a hidden picture in it that was missed until it was already in people's homes. The movie follows a few mice who need to rescue people. In one of the scenes they're flying down a ramp in a sardine can and in a window in the background you can see a topless lady. Full on boobies in a kids movie. The mystery as to how a couple of double D's made their way into a kids movie has never been cracked but there are a few legends that go along with it. Some say it was a disgruntled employee who wanted to get revenge on Disney for putting him through development hell. Other people think it was the Illuminati trying to send sexually subliminal messages to kids. But in the end we all know that there were boobs in that movie for sure. But unless you have the original VHS you are not going to see them as they were obviously taken out in later versions. At number 8 we have 3 men and a baby and a ghost. This was a famous rumor that was flying through word of mouth before we had Reddit to break everything down for us and ruin shows like Westworld. Come on guys, why'd you do that? But there is a famous scene in the movie Three Men and a Baby that looks as if there's a ghost of a young boy standing in the background. Some people think this might have been the ghost of a boy who died on the location years ago, only ever seen on camera in this shot. He wanted his 15 minutes of fame. It doesn't matter if he was dead. He deserves the limelight just as much as the next person. But there are some people that say this isn't a ghost at all. That it is just a cutout of one of the actors from the movie. But it's so much more fun to believe that it's a ghost. At number 7 we have Mr. Rogers killed people? Mr. Rogers is probably the best representation of how people should be good. His moral compass was always pointed at the right thing to do and he was an example for everyone on how to be a good person. But there was a legend floating around that he was actually a Vietnam sniper and had racked up a number of kills. Now this has been disproven as Mr. Rogers never had any sort of military background. He never even tried to get into the military. But some people think that the records were erased because the popularity of his kids show. I don't think that's how the military works. But this one is a wild one and I wanted to throw it on the list. At number 6 we have Walt Disney's head. We all know Disney. They own more than half of the entertainment industry in North America. How could you not know them? It's crazy to think that the empire all started from one guy. Well there are rumors that the epic animator had a final wish at the time of his death. He thought that in the future there would be a chance he could be pulled from the grave and brought back to life. So he had his head chopped off and frozen, put into cryostasis. So if we ever got the technology to the point where we could reanimate people from the dead, he would be first on the list. And he would be one of those talking head dudes like in Futurama. They said his head along with his body was cremated. But if I was super rich, I wouldn't tell my family about my secret cryo plans. All these plans would stay top secret and then a YouTuber would tell you guys about them. At number 5 we have Kubrick faked the moon landing. There's a lot of people who think the moon landing was fake. But this goes even deeper. If you're going to fake the moon landing you need to bring in some of the best to make it happen. The legend says that it was none other than Stanley Kubrick. He has directed some of the strangest things around and has an eye for the sci-fi so who better to do it. People are so caught up in this theory that they said Kubrick left hints behind in his later movies to tell the audience that the moon landing was a sham and he was in on it. At number 4 we have Sexy Lion King. Ooh. There have been sexually subliminal messages hidden in a lot of Disney movies throughout time. But one of the most famous of these subliminal messages was Nala and Simba rolling around in the grass falling in love. Elton John singing in the background. Of course singing the song Can You Feel the Love Tonight and everything was extremely romantic. Then the stars in the sky spell out sex. Now apparently this was the special effects team trying to spell out SFX. But there have been so many slip ups with pervy Disney scenes that I just don't trust them anymore. I really think they were trying to write sex in the sky. At number 3 we have Richard Gere's gerbil incident. This one was everywhere when people heard about it. South Park did an episode about it. Everyone was making jokes about it. There was rumors flying around about one of the world's most famous actors Richard Gere. I don't think there's really a light way for me to put this so I'm just going to say it. People were saying that he had to go to the hospital because he had a gerbil stuck in his butthole. It was in there for some sort of sexual gratification. He put a small rodent in his colon and then it got stuck in there and he needed medical help to have the thing removed. I don't know if the gerbil survived. 
After this rumor made its way into everyone's ears, it was later proven false, but not before his career took a major hit. But here's a piece of the story that is actually more salacious than a hamster in the back door. Apparently, this rumor was started by the Church of Scientology when Richard Gere decided to leave. Spreading horrible rumors about someone is the way they keep control over people and prevent them from leaving the church. Now, I don't know if this is true, but the whole thing is pretty crazy. Every element, the gerbil, the church, the butt, all of it is pretty nuts. And number two, we have the crow death scene. One of the most famous movie deaths ever was Brandon Lee dying in The Crow because the young actor did die on set. There was a scene where he was set to be shot and instead of the gun being loaded with a blank, there was a live round in the gun. It was a massive shock and it was in the tabloids for months. After the release of the movie, there were rumors that they used the scene where Brandon was actually killed. That was like what they put in the real movie. Now this scene was actually used by the police in an investigation and never made it into the movie. But there are the Crow truthers that think the heartless people in Hollywood saw an opportunity to profit off of his death and took it. For the number one spot, we have The Devil and The Exorcist. The Exorcist is considered one of the greatest horror movies of all time, and it came out in a time when religion was much more prominent in our culture, so seeing a girl being possessed by the devil was very off-putting. It had people literally peeing their pants in the theater. That's how afraid people were. So there's no surprise that there are some urban legends that go along with the shooting of this movie, mainly that the devil was present on the set of the movie. He probably came through to make sure they were making them look good. While shooting the movie, there were several mysterious fires that broke out of nowhere. This could have been religious people trying to burn down the set of the movie so it couldn't get made, or it might have been the devil himself walking around and wreaking havoc because that's just what he likes to do. Also, the actor Jack McGowan died shortly after shooting his own death scene in the movie. This could all be a coincidence, but it is so eerie. At number 10, we have The Omen. Any fan of horror movies knows this classic. It's centered around Damien the Antichrist born into a well-off family, and they have to deal with all his crazy shenanigans. And by shenanigans, I mean he starts killing everyone in horrible ways. Well, bringing the devil to the silver screen might have pissed off the big man upstairs because it seemed like a lot of accidents were happening out of nowhere to make sure that this movie didn't get made or that everyone involved died. In two isolated incidences, two producers and the lead actor Gregory Peck had their planes struck by lightning. Also, a plane that was supposed to be used for aerial shots was swapped out at the last minute with the new plane. The new plane worked perfectly, but the original plane was used for a separate job and crashed. Not a single person survived. A stuntman who worked on the Omen nearly died on his next movie when he was pushed off a building. The person who pushed him was never caught. The IRA bombed a restaurant and a hotel that the producers and the lead actor were staying at, and the animal handler for the movie was eaten by lions on set. Just so you know, there's a bunch of other horrible things that happened in relation with this movie, but I don't have time to fit them all in. That's how many bad things happened. At number nine, we have Jack Nicholson's family tree. This story shows you that you can't trust anyone. Even the people closest to you will try to pull a fast one on you. You need to be paranoid at all times. Well, Jack Nicholson got the shock of his life when he was 37 years old. Growing up, he probably thought it was strange that he had a sister that was 17 years older than him and his mother had him so late in life. But sometimes these things happen. Well, it turns out that it was all a farce to save face. Jack Nicholson's sister, who was 17 years older than him, was actually his mother and the person who he thought was his mother was his grandmother. That would give anyone trust issues for their entire life. The sad part about this is he didn't find out about it until both of them had passed away. He never got to talk to them about this and why they decided to make this move for his life. It was his aunt who unveiled the family secret to him. At number eight, we got the Taco Bell dog. If you were a 90s kid, then you absolutely remember the Taco Bell dog. It made everyone want to shove fast food into their mouth holes more than that creepy clown Ronald McDonald ever could. And at the time these commercials were on, I lived in Canada and there were no Taco Bells around me. Never in my life had I been more upset that I couldn't eat fast food. Well, just like any trend, eventually it came to an end. And as the 90s wrapped up, the little chihuahua wasn't selling any more tacos. 2001 was the last time anyone would see this furball in a commercial. Rumors started circulating that because the company no longer needed the little guy, they put him down. Which is a pretty horrible thing to think about. Just because the dog can't make you any more money doesn't mean you have to kill him. What kind of monsters would do such a thing? Well, just easy art, he didn't get put down. Her name is actually Gidget and went on to continue her acting career and actually appeared in Legally Blonde too. So I've got a happy ending on this one, but I promise you it's gonna be the only happy one on the list. At number seven, we have the Stay on Main Hotel. 
If you want to engulf yourself in something sinister, then you should definitely book a stay at the Stay on Main Hotel. There's a laundry list of creepy things that have happened here. Two separate serial killers have made this place their home. While they were on murder sprees, Richard Ramirez and Jack Unterweger both called this place home for a good chunk of time. There are rumors that they hid body parts of their victims throughout the hotel. This is wild. At number 6 we have Larry David Saved Your Life. I'm not joking, this was a life or death situation and if it wasn't for Larry David this man would be dead. Juan Catalan was just minding his own business one day when the police approached him to take him in for some questioning. It seemed like they were convinced that he was responsible for the murder of a 16 year old girl. Catalan insisted that it was not him and he had the perfect alibi to prove that he wasn't there. He said that he was at a Dodgers game at the time the murder was taking place. But the police didn't buy it so he was put on trial for the murder of this young woman. If he was found guilty he would have been given the death penalty. Thank God Catalan had a good lawyer because this dude did some digging, found out that the day Catalan said he was at the Dodgers game, they were shooting an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. His lawyer got the footage of the episode and in the background you can see Catalan sitting in the stands. The man was able to walk free. I can see the baffled expression on the convicting lawyer's face as the camera zooms in and then it cuts to At number 5 we have Sharon Tate at Paul Burns house. I know some of our viewers are too young to know who Sharon Tate was. She was going to be the next big thing back in the 60s. She was gorgeous, talented and had a unique look that would stick in the minds of anyone who saw her on film. But she became one of the high profile victims of the Manson family murders. Now before Sharon Tate met her grisly end, she was staying in the home of former 1920s film director Paul Byrne. Paul Byrne was a mysterious case. One day he was found with a bullet hole through his head. No one knew where this came from. It might have been self inflicted or it might have been someone seeking revenge on the famed director. And Sharon Tate had an encounter with his ghost while walking through his old home. But that wasn't all she saw. She also witnessed a ghostly figure of a man with his neck slashed open and blood pouring onto the floor. Some people think this was the spirits trying to warn her of what was lurking in her future. Not the best way to go about it though, like leave me a note or something, like a bleeding dude? I don't know what to do with that. And number 4 we have Party at Kitty and Studs. Sylvester Stallone is one of the greatest stars of our time. Rocky, Rambo, Demolition Man, The Expendables, Over the Top, Creed. This guy is a legend. But how did he get his start in the film industry? Huh? I don't know. Well rumor has it that it wasn't the way you think. Apparently the first time Sylvester Stallone was ever on camera was in an adult film called Party at Kitty and Studs. And apparently it's still out there in the wild. The title was changed to The Italian Stallion. After Stallone's success, he was clearly the star of the porno. Of course we cannot show you how Rocky lays pipe on this show, but I'm sure if you do a little googling you can find that old grainy footage on the internet somewhere. At number 3 with Paul McCartney is actually dead. In 1966 Paul McCartney survived a brutal car accident and everyone was very happy because the Beatles lived on and now we have a mass of excellent music to listen to. But there are a ton of Beatles truthers that think Paul never survived the crash. People think that he died on that night and because the Beatles, their managers and everyone else involved saw the massive amount of money they were about to make, they weren't about to pass up on this opportunity. So they got a lookalike to come in, taught him the guitar and then kept the band together without letting anyone know they had replaced Paul with a doppelganger. The irony about this theory is that Paul has outlived two members of the Beatles and might actually be be the last man standing. At number 2 we have the Vogue Theatre. An old timey looking theater that was thrown up in 1992. A place like this you would suspect is haunted by a ghostly usher as phantom apparitions appear on the screen. But the backstory of this place is much more gruesome. At the turn of the 20th century there was no Vogue theater sitting on this property, but there was an elementary school. One day the school caught on fire and burnt to the ground. For the most part everyone was okay, but not everyone made it out safe. 25 children and a few teachers died in the fire. After the theater was built people started experiencing strange things. Some some people reported hearing children's laughter while other people said they could hear screams of pain. Some people said they could smell burning wood. A team of paranormal investigators came in to check the place out. They were able to locate 9 different spirits lurking around the property. Since then the spirits have been removed but you never know when they might come back to pull some tricks. And for the number 1 spot we have the ghost of the Hollywood sign. I felt like this was a perfect fit for the top spot on this list. It involves the world famous Hollywood sign that is literally the representation of Hollywood. Big, fancy and in your face and of course it has a ghost. The sign is said to be haunted by the ghost of Peg Entwistle. She was an aspiring actress in the late 1920s. Once she got the taste 
taste for acting, she decided to move to Tinseltown and make something of herself. So in 1930, she made the trek down to Los Angeles. But things didn't go as planned. The problem with acting is it's a waiting game. You can work as hard as you want, but you really need someone to pick you and put you in a movie for you to move forward. Well, nobody picked in Twistle. She just sat there waiting and it broke her heart. She couldn't handle the rejection. So in 1932, she climbed to the top of the H of the Hollywood sign and jumped to her death. Sort of poetic in a way. She left a note behind that read this, I'm afraid, I'm a coward, I'm sorry for everything. If I had done this a long time ago, it would have saved a lot of pain. P.E. Now it's said that her ghost still walks around the sign. 